All right. You can see what we're going to be tackling. A cappella, you guys know that means without instruments. Okay, that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, I've been in the church for almost 40 years, just short of that. And I can tell you that in my experience, contrary to the caricature of us obsessing on the topic, we almost never talk about why we don't use musical instruments in our worship of God. And I think there are multiple factors motivating our neglect of this subject, but our shying away from it has negative consequences that we don't always appreciate. And the failure to teach on this topic, it has left the impression with many people, especially younger people, that a cappella worship is not a matter of God's will, but it's a mere human preference, an optional practice that we inherited from the 19th century American Restoration Movement and continue to follow either because we simply enjoy it or because we're trapped in tradition. And some of you, I suspect, feel that way. Now, those who think that, who believe that a cappella worship is a mere human tradition, can easily grow frustrated with and resentful toward those who insist on the practice. You see, in their minds, that's nothing more than selfishly insisting on one's own way, imposing one's personal preference on the group and being unwilling to accommodate what they see as another equally valid preference. So the failure to teach on the topic, it ends up fueling a lack of respect for the a cappella view and ultimately disharmony. Now, I'm convinced that a cappella worship is indeed a matter of God's will. And that's not a conclusion I arrived at lightly. It is the result of much study, and my goal in this class is to share the fruit of that study with you. Now, this is one of those issues that to address properly requires one to take a broader theological scope. And I think that's part of the problem, that we, we've tended to substitute short answers. The theological equivalent of sound bites that understate the strength of the a cappella position. And in doing that, I think we've done a disservice to our brothers and sisters. And I hope in this class to provide you a fuller picture, but you're going to need to stick with me and stay engaged. You can't zone out. You see, stay with me on this. Now, though I think it is wrong, I think it is sinful to use instrumental music in the worship of God. I don't believe those who disagree with me on the issue are, for that reason, bound for hell. Now, that doesn't mean the issue is unimportant. It is not, everything isn't divided into hell-bound or trivial. It doesn't mean the issue is unimportant. No aspect of God's will is unimportant. And as Christians, we are devoted to pleasing God in everything, it simply means that, in my opinion, this is one of the many issues regarding which God will forgive the Christian's sincere error, either mine or theirs. This is one of those things. If every incorrect belief or practice, every misunderstanding of God's will consigns one to hell, well, we're all in trouble. Now, I couldn't worship with a group that uses musical instruments as it would offend my conscience. But I can still consider them my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I know some, maybe most, in churches of Christ disagree with me on that. But that's how I see it, so that's what I tell you. Now, if you're already convinced that instrumental music is acceptable in the worship of God, all I can ask is that you give me a fair hearing. Okay, try to listen to the entire presentation, which is going to take weeks, but try to, list, try to listen to the entire presentation with an open mind, and then decide if you think that my understanding has merit. If you can't do that, 
at least don't cover your ears, yell, and grit your teeth at me. All right? Let's agree to that. Now, if nothing else, I hope you'll learn some things in the class and gain a new respect for the a cappella position. It is not the result of ignorance. And it is not the result of idolizing the church of the 1950s, as one sometimes hears. Now, it will certainly help if you can attend all the classes or view online those that you miss because they all fit together in establishing the point. Now, in the class, I'm going to quote many scholars, and I will oftentimes provide you information about their academic qualifications. I know that annoys some of you, okay? I know that, but you need to know the number and caliber of sources on which I rely in making certain assertions, particularly regarding matters of history. You need to know that I'm not blowing smoke or passing off as fact the opinion of some unqualified poser, somebody I pulled off the internet. The people I cite are respected scholars, often specialists in the relevant disciplines, and with the exception of Everett Ferguson, they are not affiliated with the Church of Christ. Now I say that lest you think I'm giving a false impression of the scholarly landscape by selectively citing only our people. I'm not doing that. And I hope that by making the series available on the internet, it will help some people beyond this room. And I'm grateful always for Bernard Dawson and his recording and putting the classes online for Rich and his doing that on the church website. Now, something's happened to my classes on the church website. They're not there. I'm hoping that, you know, that'll get fixed or whatever and that these will wind up being there so you can access them there also. All right. I want to begin with two initial points that are very important, really foundational for what I'll be saying. And the first point here is that musical instruments were common in the first century and were used on all sorts of occasions in Greek, Roman, and Jewish cultures, and especially in religious activities. Now let me read you a quote from Everett Ferguson. Now Ferguson earned his Ph.D. in church history from Harvard University. He served as a professor of church history at Abilene Christian University for many years. He has written books and countless articles on the early church. He served as the editor of the Encyclopedia of Early Christianity. Ferguson writes in his book, Backgrounds of Early Christianity, Music was found at banquets and other entertainments, at weddings and funerals, at official occasions, and as an accompaniment to sacrifice and other ritual acts in cultic practice. These uses in the Greek and Roman cultures were also present in the Jewish. The use of musical instruments in the Jewish culture is evident in the New Testament. You can see, for example, music and dancing at the celebration of the prodigal's return in Jesus' parable in Luke 15. Flute players at the ruler's house for a dead girl's funeral in Matthew chapter 9. Children in Jesus' parable saying, we piped to you and you did not dance in Matthew 11:17 and Luke 7, verse 32. Now, Eric Werner, who was a renowned Jewish historian of music, Werner was the founder of the School of Sacred Music of Hebrew Union College, and he, wound, he, he served there as a professor of liturgical music from 1939 to 1967. And he writes in the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, the Jews consider themselves a particularly musical people, as we learn from their literature. Indeed, there's external evidence to affirm this strange belief that they were particularly musical. He says an Assyrian bas relief's inscription praises the victory of King Sennacherib over King Hezekiah and relates the latter's ransom and tribute. It consisted, aside from precious metals, of Judean musicians, male and female. In Psalm 137, we read that the Babylonians demanded from their Hebrew prisoners songs of Zion. 
to ask for musicians as tribute and to show interest in the folk music of a vanquished enemy was unusual indeed. Now, in keeping with the requirements of the Old Testament, musical instruments also were used in worship in the Jewish temple. In the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, it says, Indeed, the Israelites excelled in music, perhaps more than any of their contemporaries, and nowhere more so than in their corporate worship. From the beginning, music and song were at the heart of temple worship, a tradition that continued when the second temple was built. The scale on which this took place was impressive. There were string, wind, and percussion instruments. So I want you to see this first point is that these instruments are used on all sorts of occasions. They are used in Greek, Roman, Jewish cultures, perhaps especially in Jewish cultures, and they're used in religious activities. Second foundational thing, despite this prevalence of musical instruments in first century life and religion, they were universally absent from Christian worship for centuries, probably for the first 900 plus years of the church. And then they came to be used only in the Western church, which of course at that time was the Roman Catholic Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church, which formally separated from the Roman Catholic Church in A.D. 1054, has never allowed instruments. So they came to be a long time after, and only in the West is when these things came in. You see, in this long period of time of singing without instruments, that's why singing without instrumental accompaniment, that's why it is called a cappella. As Ferguson says in his book, A Cappella Music, a cappella comes from the Latin by way of Italian and means in the style of the church, as is done in the church. Now, that the early church didn't use instruments in worship, this is recognized by the vast majority of scholars. This isn't some quirky idea of the Church of Christ. This is understood by the vast majority of scholars. Why do I say that? Let me, let me give you some, first a few scholars who recognize that it's, that it's understood by the vast majority of scholars. For example, Jan Michael Jonkus, who was a liturgical theologian who, who taught at the University of St. Thomas, and the University of Notre Dame in his chapter Liturgy and Music in the Handbook for Liturgical Studies, he says there seems to be scholarly agreement that Christians did not employ instrumental music at their worship during this early patristic era. Scholarly agreement. Wendy Porter, who's the Director of Music and Worship at McMaster Divinity College in Ontario, Canada, in the Dictionary of New Testament Background, she concurs as to the state of scholarly opinion. She said most scholars also think, think that singing in the early church was unaccompanied. Now, Everett Ferguson, he puts the matter more forcefully in a paper titled Congregational Singing in the Early Church. This is a paper he presented at a symposium in 2007. Ferguson says it probably goes without saying in this context that the singing in the early church was unaccompanied by instrumental music. This fact is recognized by nearly all historians of church music and of Christianity in the ancient and early medieval periods. Nearly all of them recognize it. It's not a fantasy. It's not something dreamed up. It's something that is widely recognized. Now let me illustrate that for you. I show you that here are some scholars who say that is the consensus view. Most scholars understand that. Now let me illustrate that for you. Beginning in the late 19th century, Frederick Ritter, who was professor of music at Vassar College, he wrote in his book, The Student's History of Music, we have no real knowledge of the exact character of the music which formed a part of the religious devotion of the first Christian congregations. It was, however, purely vocal. Instrumental music was excluded at first from the church service. 
Joseph Otten. He's a church musician educated at the Liege Royal Conservatory of Music in Holland. He writes in his article, Music, Musical Instruments in Church Service, in Church Services in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Otten says, for almost a thousand years, Gregorian chant without any instrumental or harmonic addition was the only music used in connection with the liturgy. Gerhard Geitman is a teacher, was a teacher of classical languages and aesthetics at St. Ignatius College in Holland in his article titled Music in the Catholic Encyclopedia. He says, although Joseph, Josephus tells of the wonderful effects produced in the temple by the use of instruments, the first Christians were of, the first Christians were of too spiritual a fiber to substitute lifeless instruments for or to use them to accompany the human voice. George Stewart, who was a reverend of the Church of Scotland in his book, Music in Church Worship, he says, in the early Christian church, there was, however, a strong feeling against the use of instruments in divine worship. Theodore Finney, he was the head of the Department of Music at the University of Pittsburgh in his book, A History of Music. Finney says the early Christians refused to have anything to do with the instrumental music which they might have inherited from the ancient world. Then he says elsewhere, we have seen that at the very beginning of the Christian period, the church eschewed all use of instruments in its service. Hugo Leichtentritt, Leichtentritt was a professor of music at Harvard University in his book, Music, History, and Ideas. He says, only singing, however, and no playing of instruments was permitted in the early Christian church. Ilian T. Jones, he was a professor of practical theology at San Francisco Theological Seminary. He states in his book, a historical approach to evangelical worship. Instruments have not always been used in Christian worship. Apparently, through the early centuries, certainly throughout the medieval period, the chants, recitatives, responses, and chorus music were unaccompanied by musical instruments. In his work, uh, Eric Werner, I mentioned him, he was a renowned Jewish historian of music. Werner writes in his book, Ancient and Oriental Music, he says, in the primitive Christian community, instrumental music was thought unfit for religious services. The Christian sources are quite outspoken in the condemnation of instrumental performances. Originally, only song was considered worthy of direct approach to divinity. James McKinnon was an internationally respected historian of music and liturgy. He's a Roman Catholic, or was. He earned his PhD from Columbia University in 1965 his doctoral dissertation was titled The Church Fathers and Musical Instruments. Afterward, he published many works in the field of early music, including the 1987 book Music in Early Christian Literature. In an article published in the journal <clears throat> Current Musicology, McKinnon writes, the antagonism, which the, now remember his doctorate was on Church Fathers and Musical Instruments. That was his dissertation. He says, the antagonism which the fathers of the early church displayed toward instruments has two outstanding characteristics. Vehemence, they really opposed them, and uniformity, they all opposed them. He says, a careful reading of all patristic criticism of instruments will not reveal a single passage which condemns the use of instruments in church. Now, it's not like they're saying it's okay to use them in church. Just listen to what he says, what that means. He says, a careful reading of all patristic criticism of instruments will not reveal a single passage which condemns the use of instruments in church. The context of the condemnation may be the banquet, the theater, or the festivities accompanying a marriage, but it's never the liturgy. The implication for the performance of early Christian music is obvious. Not only was it predominantly vocal, it was so exclusively vocal 
that the occasion to criticize the use of instruments in music never arose. Instruments in church never arose. You see, so you don't have that. Why? Because they weren't doing it there. Nobody was doing it there. Christian Hanek was professor at the Bavarian University in Germany. He was the director for the Institute of Liturgical Studies at the Ukrainian Catholic University. And in his article on the music of the early Christian church, as published in volume four of the 20 volume work, the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, Hanek says, the religion of classical Greece and the Jewish temple liturgy both used musical instruments extensively as literary descriptions and artistic representations show. By contrast, early Christian music excluded them completely. There is much evidence for this prohibition. Everett Ferguson, I've already introduced Ferguson. He says in his book, The Instrumental Music Issue, the testimony of early church history is clear and strong that early Christians employed vocal music but did not employ instrumental music in their assemblies. Edwin Good is emeritus or was emeritus professor of religious studies at Stanford University. Good writes in the Oxford Companion to the Bible, music expected to dispose the mind to truth and open the heart to pious feelings was subordinate to words. Thus, though the Psalms refer to instruments and secular music freely used them, Christian liturgy was purely vocal until the 13th century revival of the organ to accompany singing. And then he says, organs were known in some European churches well before the 13th century. So when he says 13th century, he's saying that's when it took over. And I do know that in some European churches, it was before the 13th century. Okay, but you still have this long period of time when nobody in churches is using instrumental music. W. Robert Godfrey, he's president and professor of church history at Westminster Theological Seminary in California. Godfrey writes in his article titled Ancient Praise, another feature of ancient praise which is rather certain is that the ancient church did not use musical instruments in its worship services. That may come as a major surprise to most modern Christians, but the evidence is very strong. Edward Foley. Foley is professor of liturgy and music at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. In his book, The Foundations of Christian Music, Foley acknowledges the absence of musical instruments in Christian worship from the beginning. He says the reasons for the absence of instrumental music, probably even the shofar, from Christian worship are complex. And then, then he adds, he writes, <clears throat> yeah, he concludes, he says, the absence of instrumental music in the primitive Christian community, therefore, is not simply due to its having no other option. Rather, it seems intimately wed to the embrace of democratic forms of worship, as you have in Christianity, a rejection of temple priesthood and sacrifice. You will hear me say much more about that later. And he says, and to the process of spiritualization that marked the emerging cult, that marked the, the, the Christianity. So this is what, this is what uh, uh, Foley says. Hughes Oliphant Old is a John Lath professor of Reformed Theology and Worship at Erskine Theological Seminary. Old says in his book, uh, Worship Reformed According to Scripture, it was only at the beginning of the ninth century that the church began to use organs. Up until that time, there was no instrumental music in Christian worship. Paul Westermeyer's professor of church music at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. And Meyer writes in his book, Let the People Sing Hymn Tunes in Perspective. He says, we know that for the first millennium, musical instruments were not used in church and still are not used in the Orthodox Church. 
He says that same year in an article titled Music in the Encyclopedia of Christianity, for a thousand years, the church in the East and West followed this example of being purely vocal. J. Peter Burkholter, he's distinguished professor of musicology at Indiana University. Donald J. Grout was professor of musicology at Cornell University. Claude Palaska was professor of was the professor emeritus of music at Yale University. Now these three writers in their book, A History of Western Music, they say although Christians may have used lyres to accompany hymns and psalms in their homes. Now that is an unlikely reading of something that Clement of Alexandria said that I will talk about later. But that aside, he said they say instruments were not used in church. For this reason, the entire tradition of Christian music for over a thousand years was one of unaccompanied singing. Benno Zwiedem, who's Associate Professor Extraordinary of Church History at the Theological Faculty of Northwest University, that's in South Africa. Zwiedem says, most people would be surprised to learn that the early church did not use musical instruments to accompany congregational singing. The New Testament church worshiped in spirit and in truth. I think he's right on with that, and I'll have more to say about that later. But he says, using the biblical psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, she, the church, considered that a spirit-filled human voice was sufficient and that she was no longer in need of the musical crutches of the Old Testament dispensation of shadows. And I think this is something that is on track. Andrew McGowan is dean and president of the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale University. And in his book, Ancient Christian Worship, he says this robustly non-instrumental tradition, which was to remain characteristic of Christian churches into the Middle Ages and beyond in the East, is in any case clear as a feature of ancient Christian worship, even if its roots remain at least partly mysterious. Now, as for the length of time, how long was it before the church began to use instruments? Ferguson writes in the Encyclopedia of Early Christianity, he says, the Christian heritage of vocal music <clears throat> was transmitted to the Middle Ages in the West by way of the Gregor Gregorian chant or plain song. The organ appears to have moved from the court ceremony of the emperor to the church, but only in the West. Eastern Orthodox has never allowed instruments. He says, but only in the West, and it is debated whether this occurred in the 7th century or the 10th. Now, you will find some people who will say, well, it was the 9th century, or people who will say it was the 11th century. But he says that the main contenders are 7th century and 10th century. If it's the 7th century, you're still a long way down the road, right? You're over 600 years because the 7th century date that they're talking about is the alleged introduction by Pope Vitalian in the year 670. So you're still more than 600 years down the road if it were the 7th century. But it's not the 7th century. That's almost certainly wrong to think that Pope Vitalian did, in fact, introduce instrumental music. The claim that the organ was admitted into the church in the 7th century in 670 AD by Pope Vitalian, that is rooted in a history of the church that was written by Bartolome Sacchi, who was known as Plotina, in a work that was first published in the year 1474. And as Peter Williams, who's the distinguished professor of music at Duke University, as Peter Williams explains in his book, The King of Instruments, how churches came to have organs, Plotina, or Bartolome Sacchi, he relied on the earlier work of an Italian historian, Tolomeo of Lucca. And Tolomeo of Lucca his ultimate source was the life of St. Gregory 
that was written around the year 880 by Johannes Hymonides, who was also known as John the Deacon. Now, what's the deal? So the ultimate source of this goes back to Hymonides' work, Life of St. Gregory, in 880. But the phrase in Johannes' work, that, in the, that work in the Life of St. Gregory, that's been taken as connecting Pope Vitalian with organs. This word, or words, modulationis, organum, that meant, as William says, that phrase meant, he says, the phrase in Johannes's work that has been taken as connecting Vitalian with organs meant, now I'm quoting Williams here, quote, surely not some kind of instrument, organum, nor even vocal counterpoint, organum, but most probably the approved chant itself and or its texts. In other words, to quote Williams again, the whole story of Vitalian's introduction of the organ seems to be based on a misunderstanding. So we have here, uh, Ferguson says that it's debated whether it's the 7th century or the 10th century. I say even if it's the 7th century, we're way down the road. But what I want you to see, it's very unlikely it was the 7th century because that seems to be, ba be based on a misunderstanding of the words in the root source. And that's not according to me. That's according to the distinguished professor of music at Duke University in his book on the subject. So either way, I want you to see that that's where we are. Now, so I say, I, I tell you, the church didn't use instruments for a real long time. The majority of scholars, the vast majority of scholars recognize that. I give you a number of scholars who acknowledge that is, in fact, the consensus view. Then I run through all these quotes to illustrate that consensus for you, so you're not left just with these people saying, that's what most scholars believe. I wanted you to see. Okay, so I ran through those. But you may be going, okay, that's fine. I now understand that the consensus view that most scholars recognize that the church didn't use instruments for many centuries. But you say, I want to know why. Why do they think that? What has led the majority of scholars, the vast majority of them, to conclude that the church did not use musical instruments for many centuries? Well, the conclusion of scholars that the church didn't use instruments for many centuries, that's based on two things. It is based on the New Testament, and it's based on the non-canonical writings, non-canonical writings of early Christians, meaning the writings of early Christians that are not part of the New Testament. So you have these two things together driving the scholarly consensus that instruments were not used in church for many, many centuries. Now, as for the New Testament, what does the New Testament have to contribute to this conclusion of scholars? Well, as for the New Testament, musical instruments, musicians, or instrumental music are never mentioned as being part of Christian worship, though singing is mentioned on multiple occasions. These other instruments, musicians, Instrumental music, never mentioned. Yet singing is mentioned many times. Matthew and Mark report that Jesus and the disciples sang a hymn after he instituted the Lord's Supper. And Paul and Silas sang while in stocks in prison. Nothing is said of instruments, musicians, or instrumental music. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul addresses and regulates the worship assembly in Corinth. He mentions singing, but he says nothing about musical instruments, musicians, or instrumental music as part of their worship. When he mentions the flute and the harp in chapter 14, verse 7, as part of his illustration of the inappropriateness of speaking in tongues in an assembly without an interpreter, he describes them disparagingly as lifeless. As lifeless. 
And Paul speaks of singing in Christian assemblies. That setting is implied. He speaks of singing in Christian assemblies in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. But again, he says nothing about instruments, musicians, or instrumental music. Indeed, in Ephesians 5.19, there seems to be a perfect opportunity It just seems to be calling for it, a perfect opportunity to mention instrumental accompaniment if it existed. As Paul, he refers to their addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And then he speaks of them singing and making music to the Lord. But he says, singing and making music to the Lord... But instead of saying singing and making music to the Lord with the harp or the lyre or some other kind of instrument, the flute, instead of saying that, he says singing and making music to the Lord with their heart. With their heart. So it just seems, I mean, that's just begging. It's almost saying, listen, we don't do that. You see, instead of that, we don't do that. We do it with the heart. So you have those situations, you have that there. He says that. Now, this New Testament evidence, it creates, at the very least, at the very least, it creates a suspicion that instruments were not used in the worship of the apostolic church. But that's not the only evidence that is relevant to the question. You have this in the New Testament, You see, it's never mentioned. He speaks of the instruments disparagingly as lifeless. He says, make music to the Lord with the heart. So you're thinking, hmm, that looks like they don't use instruments. You maybe say, looks like he's, he's hinting they're excluded. But that's not the only evidence that's relevant. You see, we have, we have other evidence out there. The suspicion, at the very least, the suspicion that arises from the New Testament is confirmed by later Christian writers. It is confirmed by later Christian writers. Their testimony informs our understanding of the New Testament evidence. It informs their understanding of that evidence. It illuminates that evidence and allows one to conclude as has the vast majority of scholars, that instrumental music was in fact not used in the worship of the early church. Now, that conclusion that the early church did not use instrumental music in its worship is very significant. It is very significant because it demands an answer as to why. Why? You see? Why were instruments not used in Christian worship when everything would lead you to expect that they would be? I mean, they're used everywhere. They're used especially in religion. The Jews are using them in the temple. Why? Why does the church not use musical instruments For many centuries. That question is the elephant in the room. You see, in seeking to answer that, which will be the focus of the class, that leads to a deeper or an additional understanding of why it's wrong to worship God with instrumental music. Now, when I say it leads to a deeper or additional understanding of why it's wrong, I mean it leads to an understanding that is deeper than or in addition to the argument against the use of instruments in Christian worship that one commonly hears in churches of Christ. That's what I mean. It's deeper than that or in addition to that than the argument that one commonly hears in churches of Christ. Now, I assume you are familiar with that argument. So these are the two bases of the later Christian writers. I assume you're familiar with that. But what I want to do, and I'm going to to stop and do it and start it next week. 
but I want to sketch for you, just to refresh you, okay, on, on what that more common, better known argument is. I think there is weight to that argument, but that's not really my focus. That's why I have called the class beyond the argument from silence, a covenantal view of a cappella worship. Okay, so I first I want to sketch for you what that is. I'm going to lay it out. Uh, as I will say, you, you may not have seen it laid out just the way I'm going to lay it out for you. But what, what I'm going to do, I think I've captured the essence of the argument that you have heard. But a lot of times we're not very good about laying out, why am I saying this? I'm going to try to break down and lay it out for you so you see this is the typical argument. And there's something to it. I think it has significant weight. But I just want you to see that argument, and then I want, with that noted, I then want to explore with you this deeper question of why aren't they using these instruments? And I think that's going to lead us, I hope it will lead you, it has led me to feel like the, the case is, we, we understate the case by not bringing out this other point. Because there is a strong, there, there is a strong reason, and you saw it hinted at in some of those quotes. There is a strong reason, a positive reason. I think there is something to the argument that says, listen, if you're going to worship God, you need to have some positive indication that he desires or accepts it. And we're not alone in that. I'm going to read you a quote next week from the Baptist uh, preacher, you know, Charles Spurgeon. He was probably the most famous Baptist preacher of the 19th century. And I'll read you a quote from his sermon on Hebrews 12, 28, and 29. You'd think somebody in the Church of Christ said that. So it's not a secret, the idea that in approaching a holy God, that you want to have some indication that he desires, what, rather than you presuming to give him whatever you want, because you're talented in it, or you like it, or whatever it is. So that's, that's the, the more common argument. I will lay that out for you, and then we'll go on from there, and I will explain to you why I think there, it, the case is even more powerful than that. But I want to stop here because I'm at a good stopping point, and I didn't think I'd get that far. I'm done. Thanks.